She's the basically the number three person in the Assemblies of God. So uh, she's the big kahuna. Come on, somebody. Give it up for Donna Barrett as she comes forward to share the word today. Come on. God bless you, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Pastor John, thank you. Hannah, boy, what a joy to meet you and to be here and to be able to share the word of God this morning with you. I moved to Springfield uh, May 20th and moved in on Hovey Street and I saw that three blocks down was City Reach Springfield. When I saw that, I said, that's the church I want to go to on my first Sunday in Springfield. And I enjoyed worshiping with you. And then Pastor John brought his book by, and I read it in one setting. It was so captivating, the story of what God has done in a man's life to change him from darkness into light. And so I read that book, and I said, I need to meet this guy and go out for coffee. And so we did, and uh, he said, why don't you come and preach for me? So uh, here I am, and it's a joy to be with you. I pastored Rockside Church in Cleveland, Ohio for the last 15 years. It was a church plant. And uh, my friend there was Justin and Susie Meslanka from Cleveland City Reach. And we were, we were functioning like cousins. They would come over and pray, and he would preach for me. And I would go over to his school of ministry and teach and pray with them. And uh, we were very good friends there. So when I saw that there was a City Reach ministry here, I said, I want to go and meet and be a part of what you all are doing. So God has called me here to the national office to serve in the role of general secretary. And... Um, you might wonder, what is the Assemblies of God? Maybe you know or you don't know, but if you go down Hovey Street and just keep on going, you're going to run into this big blue building that's several stories high, and that's the headquarters for a group of Christians around the world, uh, not only here in the United States, but around the world. That building has been there since 1949, and we presently have 37,000 ministers that are credentialed with the Assemblies of God uh, in the United States, and I'm proud to tell you that one out of every four or 25 percent of our credential holders are women we are part of an organization that believes the holy spirit will be poured out on sons and daughters and we don't want to hold back any part of god's army because we need all hands on deck for this this last day harvest amen And so when I left the office on Friday, I asked them for the number. We have 13,025 Assembly of God churches across the nation. So it's a, it's a big organization, many churches like this one. And I was interested to find out that 95% of the Assemblies of God is located outside the United States. Isn't that amazing? All around the world, people who are full of the Holy Spirit, loving the Lord, planting churches, getting credentials, serving God, and that's who the Assemblies of God is. That's all I want to say about the Assemblies of God, but... I love the Assemblies of God because that's where I found Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about Jesus this morning because he is the one that saves us and sets us free. I was 15 years old, and my mom met a friend who said, you need to come and visit our church this Sunday. We have a brand new pastor. He's just been there one year. His name is Jay Alford, and our church is doing a great job. Come and visit. So my mom took myself and my older and younger sister, and we went to Highway Tabernacle Assembly of God in Austintown, Ohio, in August. Well, I sat there clear until January, just checking things out. I'm not somebody to decide quickly, and I watched, I listened, I listened to the preaching and the music. Well, by January of that next year, in 1975, I said, I want to give Jesus a try in my life. And so I was sitting in the back with a group of teenagers. We weren't paying a bit of attention to the sermon. But at the end, the Spirit of the Lord grabbed hold of my heart and helped me to know that I was not ready for heaven. That if I died right then, I was not ready for heaven and I needed a Savior. We're born into sin and we need a Savior. No matter what we've done or what we haven't done, all of us need Jesus as our Savior. So I elbowed my sister and I said, will you go with me down to that altar? So I walked down the altar and I knelt about right here that Sunday morning and I gave my life to Jesus with about 15 other people. And that changed everything. It turned my life around. I had a friend in my high school who was also a Christian and a part of that church and he began bringing discipleship books to me in the cafeteria, the Navigators series. And he brought it and he said, Donna, Go through this and fill it out, and I'll check on you tomorrow. And he discipled me and helped me to, to get into the Word of God. And there's something inside of me that just caused me to be hungry for more and more of the Word, to, to listen to the radio and to study. 
There in Youngstown, we had uh, what was called Youngstown Christian Bible School with two classes on Tuesday night and two classes on Thursday night. I signed up for all four of them. I was hungry for the Word of God and just continued to chase hard after God because I had found Him as my Lord and Savior. And um, when I became uh, 18, I, I went to work downtown at the uh, county courthouse and part-time at a law office. My boss sent me to paralegal school, and I worked there for seven years. I knew I was called of God, and I thought, God, have you forgotten me? Because I know I'm called, but here I am working in a, a job that's removed from ministry. But you know what we were doing in that office? We were, we were chartering churches. We were helping nonprofit organizations find their tax-exempt status with the internal revenue. We were doing the exact kind of work that I'm doing now in the secretary's office. And so God has a way of bringing it all back full circle again. Well, eventually I, I got the opportunity to um, work at the church where I was attending as bookkeeper. And the pastor said, there is a way for you to study called Berean, Berean College, now Global University. And I began studying through distance learning. And I would encourage you that if you have a hunger for the word, we have many men and women who are in prison who are students of Global University and they're studying the word of God. Get into the word and get into some ministry opportunity like that where you're studying God's word. And so I became uh, the youth pastor at that church where I served for 10 years, moved to Cleveland as an associate pastor for seven years. That church helped us plant Rockside Church where I've been the last 15 years. And I was minding my own business in Cleveland, Ohio, when one day a phone call came saying, we'd like you to come and interview at Springfield, Missouri and be a part of the executive leadership team. So God has changed my world in a, a tremendous way, but that's a, a little bit of my testimony of how I came to know the Lord. And Jesus has changed me in incredible ways. This morning... I understand that you're in a study in the book of Luke, and the key verse is Luke chapter 19, verse 10. The word of God says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's the Savior we serve. That's Jesus. That's who I'm talking about this morning, Jesus. And I'd like to share with you my text from the book of Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 20. If you have it on your phone, turn to it, or it'll be on the screen. Luke chapter 9 verses 18 through 20. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we ask you to open our ears to what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say to each of us today. Father, we pray that you would awaken us to a realization of who you are in a more full way. We pray, Lord, you'd peel back any, any of the layers that we have yet to pull back so that we can know you more fully. We pray, God, that your will would be done and your anointing will be in this house. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. In our moments together, I want to focus on verse 20 of chapter 9 in this phrase, Who do you say that I am? And I would ask you that this morning. Who do you say Jesus is? When we look at this passage of scripture, there was confusion about who Jesus was, and they had various ideas. And you know, it's not that different here in Springfield, Missouri. I would say that most people who live in Springfield have heard the name of Jesus, but who do they say he is? Who do they know Jesus to be? Have they received an accurate representation of the Jesus of the Bible, or is it a mistaken identity? Has there been some identity theft that has gone on around the person of Jesus? Some think in Springfield, Missouri, that Jesus is a historical figure. Some think that he's the, the God that Grandma prayed to but doesn't love me. Some think that Jesus is the baby in the manger, and after and for the other 51 weeks of the year, he, he goes back into the box. Some think that Jesus is simply a swear word. But who do you say Jesus is? And why does that matter? 
I want to suggest to you this morning that when we embrace the true identity of who Jesus is, only then can we find our true identity that is rooted in Christ Jesus. And that's why it is so important. Because Jesus is the Savior, I can be the saved one, and you can be the saved one. Because Jesus is identified as the friend of sinners, I am a friend of God, and you can be a friend of God. Because Jesus' identity calls him the good shepherd, we are the sheep of his pasture. Because Jesus is identified as the king of kings, I am a daughter of the most high God, and so are you. You are a son of the most high God. Because of who Jesus is, it impacts our identity. Jesus saves, he baptizes, he calls, he leads, he empowers, and we get to know him more and more by putting just one foot in front of the other, not giving up, just seeking him, studying his word, and continuing to move forward. I felt called of God when I was about 19 years old. Our youth group went on choir tours and we traveled around and I was sitting on the second seat back from the, behind the driver looking out the window, and in my heart I said, Lord, I love ministering for you. I could do this with all of my life. And in that moment, I sensed God say, and that's what I want. I want all of your life. He called me at that moment, but he didn't open up the opportunity for full-time ministry for quite a while. As I mentioned, I worked in a law office for seven years, and then I was at the church. And there came a time when the pastor said to me, my boss, he said, if you go ahead and get your credentials by February, I'd like to bring you on staff as our youth pastor. Well, there was a, a tension in my life of saying, can a girl do that? Is it okay for a woman to be a pastor? Because the call in my heart was so real, but I had never seen it modeled before. I didn't know a woman who was a pastor. Our pastor's wife served in ministry, and I knew a lot of women who served, but I had not seen that modeled before. And so that began my wrestling of saying, is this okay? And how is this call so strong in my life when I haven't really seen this demonstrated too much? So it drew, it, it drew me to the Word of God, and I went diving into the Scripture to say, God, what do you say about the call of God being on men and women alike? And this morning, I'd like to just share a little bit with you of what the Word of God says about women in ministry, because you don't hear it preached too much, but yet you see that call that God puts on people's lives, and it's good for us to know what the Word of God says. The Word has an answer for every situation in your life, and Jesus is made known from Genesis to Revelation, not just the Gospels, and when we dig into the Word of God, He makes Himself known, and we know what He has for us. We can know from the word of God, and we can see from the nature of Jesus. Jesus treated everyone with dignity and respect, from the, the woman at the well to people that were marginalized in culture of that day. His nature was to be inclusive, to love everyone, and to empower everyone to be able to be a part of the body of Christ. So I learned as I dug into the word of God that there are two camps among Bible-believing Christians regarding women in ministry. One is a, a view called the complementarian interpretation. That's held by many of our Baptist brothers and sisters and some of the churches that love Jesus just as much as us. That position, the complementarian position, teaches that God created men and women equal in dignity but distinct in roles, both at home and at church. Thus, while it affirms that all Christian women have ministries of some kind, it denies that they can teach the Bible to a mixed group or lead the church as a whole. Only men can perform certain roles of teaching and leadership in the church according to the complementarian interpretation. That's not what the Assemblies of God believes. But when we're in discussions with other people, in every discussion... Showing the love of Jesus always rules. We never fight among the church or fight over scripture. We just share ideas. So that's the idea shared by a complementarian. I want to share with you what the Assemblies of God believes and what I believe the scriptures teach. The second camp is called egalitarian, also known as biblical equality. It under, it, uh, that group understands that the Bible teaches that God created men and women equal in all things. Thus, while it affirms that men and women are distinct from one another and have unique roles inside the family, it supports that God can and God does call and empower any person, regardless of gender, to fill any role of leadership inside the church 
and denies that only male leadership in the church is God's message. Now, I'm thankful that the Assemblies of God, as well as the Nazarenes, the Methodists, the Foursquare, and many other parts of the body of Christ around the world, has always, from its beginning, taken this egalitarian interpretation of the Bible, meaning that the Bible supports that women, as well as men, are gifted of the Spirit, called of God, and free to serve, lead, and teach in all places in the church. Can you say amen? amen. Yes. In this last days, there's a harvest to be brought in, and God needs all hands on deck. We don't need anyone marginalized or disqualified in any way, but we all need to come working shoulder to shoulder to bring in this last day's harvest and to serve the Lord. When we're interpreting scripture, there are two principles that you can keep in mind as you read the Bible that really help you to understand what is this passage saying. One is context. Context, context, context. We never pull a scripture out of the Bible and take it out of the context, but we look and say, who is this written to? What was the context? What was the culture at the time, the era, even the geography? We don't pull the passage out of context, but we keep it in there. The second principle of interpretation is that when we're understanding God's heart on an issue, we take the entire trajectory of the scripture. Isaiah 28.10 says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And so we build our theology by looking at what does the Bible say throughout the Bible about a topic. And so the, the one scripture that talks about women uh, being silent in the church is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and you'll see it on your screen, verse 12. It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And so when people see the scripture, they say, well, then how can you do what you do? I've had people ask me that, and I've entered into those conversations at different times. That was a passage that was written by Paul to Timothy for a specific situation going on at that time because of some challenges that were going on in that, church, in that church, but it was not meant to be for all people of all time. And the way we know that is because when we look at the rest of the Bible, we see again and again opportunities where women are serving, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We see examples. We see empowerment. The Bible does not limit but actually empowers so here's another passage of scripture in, in first corinthians and you can write these down and look them up later if you'd like in first corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 through 16 the bible addresses how women minister in the church not whether they minister or not and so that gives us support to know that god thinks it's a great idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it addresses how women should learn in the church, not whether they should teach or not. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, it prohibits usurping authority to teach, and that would be the case for men and women. We never want to usurp the authority of who the, the, the uh, pastor of the house is or who has the authority there. As Pentecostals, I love this passage. It supports women in ministry. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, prophecy was given that was then fulfilled in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 17. The scripture says this in Acts 2, 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And so Jesus' way of empowering men and women was to allow them to be released into ministry in all different ways. And it's so Pentecostal for women to be able to be participating together. And so I wanted to share that scripture with you. And Pastor John had asked me to speak on that issue because it was a part of my life. I was an associate pastor in Cleveland when God called me to plant a church. And one of the individuals in the church said, well, you're the planter. Who will be the pastor? And I said, well, I will be the pastor. Do we allow that? I said, yes, the Assemblies of God does allow that. <laughs> we don't hear about it enough, evidently, right? And so I wrestled again with that. I, I got an anonymous phone call one day from someone not in our tribe, but outside our tribe, challenging me and telling, telling me why that was the wrong thing to do. And so it sent me back to the Word again to wrestle with that issue. Is this okay to do? And so in my heart, I see the Word of God supporting women in ministry and that call that he put on my life. And uh, God... 
God not only releases someone for ministry, but it also makes an opportunity for the people that person is going to lead to the Lord to come to Jesus. And so we want to, we want to see that happen all the time. I love the belief statement that the Women in Ministry Network here at the Assemblies of God has on their website. Reverend Crystal Martin leads that ministry. And here's their one-sentence belief statement that is so healthy and proactive. I want to share it with you today. The image of God is best reflected, and the church of Jesus Christ is healthiest when both men and women are empowered to fulfill their calling at every level of ministerial leadership. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the body of Christ? And so, you know, that's my story of how I've come through and how God has helped me and how, how I ended up where I'm at today. And you have a story, too, and those stories are so important to be told. Jason, thank you for sharing your story of what God has done in your life. How powerful is that? And it's the name of Jesus that you heard in that song that makes the difference, right? It's the name of Jesus that helps us and empowers us and, and uh, makes the difference in our lives. So I want to give you a couple questions to reflect on today. Maybe you jot this down, talk about it over lunch, or think about it. Questions for reflection. What are some ways Jesus continues to reveal to you his nature through his word and through his people? You know, as Pastor John takes you through the gospel of Luke, you're going to see the nature of Jesus and as a single man, Jesus always interacted with men and women in such a loving, compassionate, empowering way. When, as we seek to be more like Jesus, understanding the differences in gender and respecting both is the heart of Christ. Here's another question for reflection. What do you sense the Lord is saying to you about your identity because of who Christ is? And then a third question. What steps might the Lord be asking you to take to be affirming to the opposite gender and thus honoring to Christ. It goes both ways, men honoring women and women also honoring men. And a culture of honor is the culture that Jesus carried throughout his life. And so what might the Holy Spirit be saying to you today about the honor you show to the opposite gender? Well, I want to close this morning with a story. And... Um, as I have been praying about being here at City Reach today over the last couple of weeks, recently the Lord said, whatever you preach about, be sure you share the story with them because this is really good. And so I'm going to read you just a, a short story here. This is by Ann Voskamp in her book called The Way of Abundance. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, it's very therapeutic to have someone read a story to me. And so in our closing moments today, maybe even as the band returns, I want to share this, this story with you called Mastering the Dark. Anne was talking to her kids at the farmhouse, and uh, she said this. The old coot ran in his boots. Women, I'm going to come out here where the light is. Here we go. <laughs> Weren't too many of anybody who believed he could. The kids and I read about this old guy one night after supper and the dishwashers moaning away, crumbs still on the counter. How's this old guy going to run 544 miles? His name was Cliff Young, and he wasn't really so young. He was 61 years old. He was a farmer. Levi's, Levi grinned big. And this is a true story from 1983 about a race in Sydney to Melbourne in Australia. Mr. Young showed up for the race in his Oshkosh overalls and with his work boots on, galoshes over top, just in case it rained. He had no Nike sponsorship. He had no wife, hadn't ever had one, lived with his mother, never drank, never ran in any kind of race before, never ran a marathon, nor a half marathon, not even a five-mile race. But here he was, standing in his work boots in the starting line of an ultra marathon, the most grueling race in the world, 544 miles. Try wrapping your head around pounding the concrete with one foot after another for 544 endless stretching miles. They don't measure this race in yards, but in zip codes. First thing Cliff did was take out his teeth. Said his false teeth rattled when he ran. <laughs> Said he grew up on a farm with sheep and no four-wheelers, no horses, so the only way to round up the sheep was to run. 
Sometimes the best training for the really big things is just the everyday things. That's what Cliff said. Whenever the storms would roll in, he said, I'd have to go and round up the sheep. 2,000 head of sheep, 2,000 acres of land. Sometimes I'd have to run those sheep for two or three days. I can run this race. It's only two more days. Five days, I've run sheep for three. Got any backers? Reporters shoved their microphones around old Cliff like a spike belt. No. Cliff slipped his hands into his overall pockets. Well, then you can't run. Cliff looked down at his boots. Does a man need backers or does he need, does a man need to believe? What you believe is the biggest backer you'll ever have. The other runners, all under a buffed 30 years of age, they take off like pump shots from the starting line. And scruffy old Cliff staggers forward. He doesn't run, shuffles more like it, straight back, arms dangling, feet awkwardly shuffling along. Cliff eats dust. For 18 hours, the racers blow down the road, far down the road, and old Cliff shuffles on behind. Come the pitch black night, the runners of the $400 Nikes and (laughs) and Adidas lie down by the roadside because that's the plan to win an ultra marathon. You run 544 miles straight, 18 hours of running, six hours of sleeping, Rise and repeat for five days, six days, seven days. The dark falls in, runners sleep, cameras get turned off, and the reporters go to bed. And through the black night, one 60-year-old man far behind keeps shuffling on. And all I can think is, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehendeth it not. Catalambano, comprehend, understand, master. Well, Cliff Run runs on through the night, (laughs) and there is an abundant light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not master it. The darkness doesn't understand the light, doesn't comprehend the light, doesn't get the light, doesn't overcome the light, doesn't master the light. Darkness doesn't have anything on light, on hope, on faith. The darkness that sucks at the prodigal kid doesn't have anything on the light of his mother's prayers. The black of pornography that threatens at the edges doesn't master the blazing light of Jesus at the center. The pit of depression that plunges deep doesn't go deeper than the love of your Jesus. And there is no place his light won't go to find you, to save you, to hold you. That low-lying storm cloud that hangs over you cannot muster the light of Christ that raises you. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. He said it and he lived it. Only words of light can drive out worlds of darkness. Only lives of light can drive out lies of darkness. Darkness can never travel as fast as light. No matter how bad things get, no matter how black the darkness seems, no matter the depths of the night, the dark can never travel as fast as light. The light is always there first, waiting to shatter the dark. Well, Cliff Young runs on through the night because he didn't know you were supposed to stop. The accepted way professional runners approach the race was to run 18 hours, sleep six for seven days straight. But Cliff Young didn't know the acceptable way. He only knew what he did back home, the way he had always done it. You run through the dark. Turns out when Cliff Young said he gathered sheep around his farm for three days, he meant he had run across 2,000 acres of farmland for three days straight through the night without stopping. You're gathered sheep by running through the dark. So along the endless stretch of highway, Cliff gained ground because he ran through the dark. Well, for five days, 15 hours and four minutes straight, Cliff Young ran, never once stopping for the dark, never stopping until this old sheep farmer crossed 
the finish line first. <laughs> he beat the world record by two days. <laughs> The second place runner came across the finish line almost 10 hours later after Old Cliff. That's not the end of the story. Listen to this. When they handed him the $10,000 prize, he said he hadn't even known there was a prize. <laughs> said he'd run just for the wonder of it. Said that others, other one... Other runners had worked hard too, so he waited at the finish line and he handed each of the five who finished an equal share of his prize and he went home with nothing. <laughs> I sit there in the thickening dark with the one who mastered the darkness and overcame the storm to gather his sheep. And I remember that now there is one who is abundant light, who shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never overcome him. And his name is Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Will you stand together with me across this room as we bow in prayer? Jesus, we thank you that you penetrate the darkness with the light of your nature. And Lord, we know that this morning you have brought some people into this house to meet you and to know you and to find you as their personal Savior. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to draw those individuals to yourself and let them know this is a safe place, this is the right day, you are the Savior of the world, you are the friend that sticks closer than a brother, and today is the day for them to say yes to Jesus. And if you're in this room today and you'd like to say yes to Jesus and, and find him as your Lord and Savior, would you just throw your hand up in the air right now with every head, open, every head up and every eye open? Would you say, I want Jesus in my life. I need to know him as my Savior. Today is the day I want to follow after him. Now I'm going to ask you to do another brave step. Would you excuse yourself from the pew where you're sitting and come on down here to the front because I want the privilege to pray with you. Come on down. Don't wait. Come on. Hallelujah. Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Maybe you're watching and you're waiting and you think, I want to do this, but I pause. Come on down. We're waiting for you too. Please. This is a golden moment. Like Jason said, you don't know if this is your last opportunity to say yes to Christ. You don't know when this life will end and you'll be in eternity forever. And Jesus is the one who has prepared eternity for prepared people to enter into heaven. So don't wait. Don't give this opportunity a, a second look. Just come on down and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior if you're here in this place today. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming down. Thank you for being here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now just to let you borrow some of, some of my words. And if you would just repeat this prayer after me, but mostly mean it from your heart, okay? Will you do that? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess to you that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I invite you this morning to come into my life and be my Savior, be my Lord. I want to live for you all the days of my life. Help me, Jesus, to be a follower of you for all of time into eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a, a hand, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask you if you'll just go to my left right here and Pastor Dave is going to give you some more information and pray with you again. And so if you'll just go this direction if you found Jesus this morning and Pastor David has some materials he wants to give you. This is the beginning of a decision to follow Jesus and this church can help you learn the word, learn how to pray, put one foot in front of another just like clifted in that race so that you cross that finish line. You need help to cross the finish line. It's not just about saying yes to Jesus. It's about saying yes to Jesus tomorrow and the next day and continuing to follow after him. Amen. Amen. 
Now, if you're just hungry this morning to get to know Jesus a little bit more than you did before, you want him to increase your passion for the word, you want to know him a little bit better, and you're saying, I, I just need to press in this morning while God is in the house and there are people here to pray for me, would you just come down to the altar and we want to pray and end our time together asking the Lord to reveal himself to us in greater ways. So this altar is open. We'd be happy to pray for you. Just come on down and let's continue to press in to the person of Jesus Christ who wants to know you and be known in greater ways. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who continually reveals yourself. And Lord, we pray for every person in this room, God, for all of us that you would increase our appetite for more of you, that you would increase our understanding of who you are. Lord, that you would put a passion in our hearts for the word of God. Father, we pray for more of you. We press in and seek you. God, your word says that if we will seek you, we will find you. That if we will seek you with all of our hearts, we, you will be found. And so, Lord, we seek you. We press in. We call on you, God. And we pray, Lord, for your power to be revealed in this place. God, be glorified in this house. Be honored among us, O Lord. Father, help us to continue to put one foot in front of the other. Lord, we pray for the men and women who are running the Hope House. We pray, God, for those that have difficult assignments at this season of life, that you would help us, Lord, just to be faithful to put one foot in front of the next and continue this race that you have put before us with our eyes fixed firmly on that finish line that we will one day cross when we see you face to face in heaven. May we never quit. May we never give up, Lord, but pour out your spirit in lives. Fill people with your Holy Spirit this morning, we pray. Be glorified, we ask. Be glorified and honored, we pray in Jesus' name. Pastor John's gonna come and just continue to lead us. God bless you this morning. Amen. Thank Pastor Don, I want you to stay up here with me for one second. Jesus. This is what I wanna do. Before we, before we start moving around, you, you, some of you guys know, know my story. You know what I mean about when God called me to the ministry. So I had been in the men's home for Four months you know what I mean I went to a, a conference for a men's home a conference you know what I mean in Glorieta New Mexico and I remember that day this is gonna I want this is gonna be a solemn moment for someone here today because I was feeling this in my spirit as I was right there so but watch this what happened was is the guy the the evangelist that first night said I believe you know what I mean there's people here that God is calling you to full-time ministry to vocational ministry you know what I mean and all the all the my men's home went down a bunch of people went down you know what I mean but I thought I'm not going down there unless you speak to me Lord and the presence of God fell upon me and I began to weep like I never had before in my entire life you know what I mean this was in early January of 1999 and I walked down that altar and I lifted my hands and I began to speak in a prayer language that I had never learned and later I found out that was tongues but you know what God empowered me and called me to ministry that day and while we have the person that oversees the credentials for for our fellowship and at, at this church we have people that are Baptist we have people that are church of God. We have people that are Presbyterian. So we have lots of a, 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 a eclectic group. You know what I mean? But I am ordained with the Assemblies of God. I've been trained in Assemblies of God a seminary. You know what I mean? And while we have Pastor Donna here, I believe that today that God right now, like he spoke to me some, you know what I mean, 18 years ago, 20 years ago, he spoke to me that I was called to ministry. I believe there's some people here that God's calling to be a pastor, preacher, evangelist, apostle. And watch this. Let me tell you something. We're all called to do the work of the ministry. We're all called to be evangelists. Some of us, you know what I mean, make tents. Some of us, you know, are, are, are mechanics. Some of us are plumbers. But we're all called to be active in the ministry. Doing the ministry is not something the pastor does. That's something we all do. And the pastors and the leaders in the church help prepare you to do the work of the ministry according to Ephesians chapter 4. So this is what I, this is what I believe. I believe God, and, and just this section right here in the middle. You know what I mean? I, 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 in a second, I'm, I believe God is calling some of you. You know, let's just close our eyes right now, everybody at this place. In this place, I believe God is calling you. He's tugging at your heart to vocational ministry. He's saying, He said, he, He's saying, you know what? I've called you. This young man, go ahead and come forward. He feel so. If you feel God is calling you to the ministry, and I don't care if you're a man, a woman, a child. Come on, God is. If you feel God. God is calling you to the ministry. He's tugging upon your heart. I want you to make your way down here and say, that's me, preacher. I believe God is 
calling me to the ministry, to, to, the, to the five-fold ministry, to be an apostle, pastor, preacher, teacher, or evangelist. And I want you to come forward. I'm going to ask Donna to begin to pray with you as you come forward. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Look at this. Go ahead and continue to come forward. You feel God's called you. You feel God's called you to the ministry. Go ahead and come forward. Let's begin to worship right now and just reach out to God, cry out to God. God sees that you answered this. God's going to raise you up. Look at this young man. What's your name? Miguel. Miguel. Miguel, how old are you? Good. How old, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve years old. Feels God has called him to the ministry. God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Miguel right here. God, Lord, we pray that you would raise him up to be a preacher of the gospel. God, Lord, pray that you would raise him up, God, to be a man of integrity. God, that doesn't go the ways of this world. But, God, Lord, he would be a young man who serves you faithfully throughout elementary school, throughout high school, God, into college. And you would raise him up. And that he would always remember this day when he walked forward and said, I feel God has called me to the ministry. God, Lord, we thank you, God, for your call. Oh God. Thank you, God, that you're calling men and women to the work of the ministry, God. Show Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, Lord, we thank you. You're no respecter of persons, God. Lord, we need all hands on deck. God, Lord, for the harvest that you're raising up, God. God, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for Zach. God, that you called him, that you separate him, even since before the foundations of this world. And you revealed your calling to him in prison. And you're raising him up, God. He's in Bible school. God, Lord, you're taking him. I pray, God, that you would sustain him. God, Lord, from every lie and every tactic of the enemy that would get him off course, that you would keep him on course. Hallelujah, Jesus. Right now, even at, at this altar or out there in the pews right now, God's going to begin to give you a picture in your head. He's going to begin to give you a vision of what he's called you to do. I remember when I was in prison, God gave me pictures in my head of me preaching in prisons, of me preaching in churches, and it seemed impossible at that time, but God brought his vision to pass. Right now, God's given some of you visions of what he's called you to do. He's given you pictures in your head. Right now, what he's called you to do, he's called some of you. Some of you are going to travel the world. You're going to lay hands on the sick, and they're going to recover, Jesse. You're going to travel the world. God's going to raise you up. He's going to raise you up to travel the world, lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's the power of God flowing through you right now. So rip. Oh, he's going to raise you up, send you across the world. And there's going to be stadiums filled. There's going to be stadiums filled. You're going to lay hands on the sick. And they will recover in mass, in mass, in mass.
take it all. Every part of my world, oh my Jesus, this love that we this for the calling on our lives just to be used by, by you, Lord Jesus. Use us in any way that you want to, Lord God, whether it be speaking, ministering, praying, whatever it may be, Lord God. Use us for your glory, Jesus. As we go throughout our weeks, let us keep your name on our lips and a praise in our hearts. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cover you with his unending love never-ending grace. We say thank you today, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you.